as the fire approached, we could hear gas tanks exploding. It then reaches a point where you've done all you can do and you're, you know you've got no escape. We had no option of running away. We just had to sit and wait. That first wildfire you go on, you either come away from it absolutely hooked and you want to do it for the rest of your life, or you just think, uh, I'm not doing that again. The conditions themselves are really, really tough. Um, very, very hot uh, weather conditions. Um, very, very low relative humidity, so it's very dry. Um, and it goes on and on and on, it's relentless. Um, if you love it, the adrenaline gets you, you get hooked by that. Um, and all the other elements that go with it. Uh, it's a, it, it, for me, it's fascinating and it, it's the place that I really feel at home. One of the biggest for me was the Valley Fire in 2015. While I was there, uh, I, I witnessed several events that, that as I say, will, will remain with me for a very long time. The days leading up to the Valley Fire have been extremely hot and extremely dry. Um, the relative humidity, which is how dry the air is, was, was actually 7%, which is extraordinarily dry. Um, and I was finding the conditions particularly tough. On the day of the Valley Fire, we'd, uh, we were just driving up through the valley uh, and we received the first call to say that there's a report of a fire. We could immediately see a column of smoke thick dark smoke rising um, and increasing in size very very rapidly. The fire behaviour uh, was like something I've, I've never seen before, never seen since. There was almost a horizontal vortex, rather like a fire tornado but on its side, running down the valley, pushing huge columns of smoke ahead of it, um, being driven by very very powerful winds. Um, and travelling at a pace that was, was not survivable. Nobody could have stood in front of that fire. The colours and the noise of that was something that, that I will just never forget. Most people see the images on TV and so on of, of helicopters or aircraft dropping loads of water onto fires or, or fire retardant, the pink stuff you, you often see. Um, these are a great help, but they don't put fires out. It's down to people on the ground, mostly with hand tools. The term used is cutting line. So that's about clearing a, a complete fuel break where you cut all the vegetation away down to sand or mineral soil. So the fire cannot cross that line. And that takes lots and lots of people, many, many hours of hard backbreaking work, just cutting and scraping. And then you've got those specialist units within that. So you've got the helitac crews, which are brought in by helicopter is, is hand crews that are just dropped off at the heart of the fire. And it was actually the helitac crew that were caught up in the fire and burnt over. And that means that they were trapped by the fire and they, they had to deploy their fire shelters uh, and let the fire burn over the top of them. If you can imagine a foil sleeping bag that you climb into, that's the best way I can describe it. They offer limited protection. It is a desperate time if you need to climb into a fire shelter. All four of these people received very serious burns. Um, some of them were career changing and life changing. Um, and they, they, they were in a very sorry state when I first came across them. Um, later the, the same day, in fact, I probably came as close as I ever have done to, to serious injury or potentially even losing my life in a wildfire. Officially surrounded, I guess you call this. At the heli base, just after evacuating colleagues, we found that we had no way out. We were now surrounded by fire. Uh, helicopters were unable to come to our assistance uh, to, to lift us off. So we had to, to burn ourselves to safety. So we cut lines around the heli base. We burnt out, so that's using fire to, to set fires that, that would run against the, uh, the wildfire that's coming towards us, just to give us a bit of breathing space. We did all of that, but the smoke, the heat, um, the smells that were coming from the fire, and the noise in particular, we could hear as the fire approached, we could hear gas tanks exploding um, from the properties around us. Many of my colleagues and myself really felt that our life was in danger at that point. 
During that time, it was very tough for everybody, I guess. Um, initially, we were extremely busy protecting the heli base and protecting our own lives. But there then reaches a point where you've done all you can do. You've cut all the line you can cut, you've burnt out what you can burn, and you're, you know you've got no escape. Nobody's coming to, to your assistance. Um, and we just had to find a spot that was away from the buildings, that was away from the fuel. We had big aviation uh, fuel tanks around us. So we, we sat in the middle of the uh, pad where the helicopter normally lands, just to wait it out. Everybody really went into their own space. Um, most people were communicating on their telephones with their families and friends. Um, I just sat and watched and looked and listened. Um, the noise was extreme as the fire burnt through. It's burning through high forest um, in a full-blown, fully developed uh, crown fire, canopy fire. Uh, running very fast, producing a lot of embers, so we were sat in an ember storm. A lot of smoke, you could hear this whistling as the gas tanks were venting off and some would eventually explode. Um, of course there are all the strong smells associated with it. Um, a forest on fire is not a particularly unpleasant smell, uh, the scents and the aromas that come from it. But then of course you've got the products of combustion, the smoke that goes with it, which gets into your lungs and uh, is really uncomfortable. Your nose is running, your eyes are streaming. Um, all of your senses are really as heightened as they can be because you are in that, that fight or flight kind of mode. Um, we had done all the fighting we can do. We had no option of running away. We just had to sit and wait and let this thing run past us. My friends and colleagues at the time found this very, very difficult. They were thinking of their families, they were messaging their families, they were dealing with it all in their own different ways. Um, for some it was very emotional. Um, I myself actually have Asperger's, so I don't have the normal range of emotions, um, but I can still remember the effect that it had on, on those people. Um, my colleagues asked me if I would take their photographs for them that they wanted to send off to their partners um, with what they thought may well have been their final messages. Uh, they insisted on taking my photograph, which I, I still have, and actually it's my screensaver on my computer. Um, and it's a photograph that I've started to call my obituary photograph because it could well have been the last photograph that was taken of me. Once we got through it, it was too many things to do to, to really sit and think about the impact of it. Um, it's not until you get clear, and, and for me it was sitting on an aeroplane flying home nine days later before I really had time even to think about that uh, particular moment. From the heli base, we withdrew to a safe location at Middletown. Within a few hours, it was evident that the fire was not going to stop. Uh, it was really gathering pace, very, very long flame lengths, just destroying the forest at a huge rate of knots. Um, and it came down the valley, it came into Middletown, and it almost completely destroyed Middletown. Um, and as a wildland firefighter, you're equipped with hand tools, um, spades, pulaskis, uh, rake hose, um, and there's very little you can do to put out structural fires. So I stood and watched an entire town destroyed around me. Two colleagues and I had to go to another location, uh, a community we knew was in, now in immediate danger. So we had to chase the fire and try and get to that community to evacuate them. And to do that, we had to drive through the fire. And it was like driving into Armageddon. Um, the, the decals, the stickers on the vehicle were peeling off. Uh, you could smell the paint getting hot in the car as we were driving down the road. We would come across cars that had been abandoned, cars that had been burnt out. Uh, we had to stop and check every car to ensure there was nobody there. Every burnt out car you expect the worst when you open the door. Um, fortunately, everybody somehow managed to escape from those vehicles. Um, we got to the community, 
and we literally went door to door down the street, uh, knocking on doors, just telling people they've got to leave now. It's not a conversation, it's a very clear instruction, um, pretty much as blunt as it needs to be. You have to leave, your life is an immediate threat. If you don't leave, you will die. Inevitably, there is loss of life in these incidents. It tends to be multiple people that lose their lives, and that's either multiple firefighters or multiple members of the public. Uh, either way, it's tragic, it's very difficult to deal with, and as a firefighter, all you can do is treat that loss of life, that person, with as much dignity and respect as you can. But you then just have to move on and continue to the next job. There's no doubt there's a, a huge attraction just to be fighting a fire. The adrenaline of approaching that fire, trying to understand what, what's going to happen, um, trying to understand um, what you may be faced. All of those things start to get the adrenaline moving and pushing through your, your system. Uh, and, and for the initial approach, the initial attack, you definitely feed off that adrenaline. Um, and it keeps you going for a long time. Uh, but it does eventually wear off and that's when it just becomes hard work. Wildfires are going to become more frequent, they're going to become larger, they're going to become more intense. And we need to prepare for that. We know it's coming, we have no excuse, so we need to prepare for those. This year for me has been particularly difficult. I would have definitely been back in California. I may have tried to get to Canada again. I'm definitely drawn to those big landscapes and the big fires. Um, but COVID has made that really difficult. Nobody's really been traveling anywhere. So uh, as soon as I can travel, I'll be back in the air, going where I can to fight fires. Mm -hmm.